The story of the Clintonville substation begins with the story of the Aurora Elgin and Chicago Railway, as the Clintonville substation was one of the six original substations built for the railway. The early history of the A, E, and C Railway is a bit complicated, as it originated from various business interests operating horse-drawn cars in Elgin and Aurora in the 1870s and 1880s, until they electrified using trolley systems around 1890. By 1901, these various businesses and trolley lines, which operated a railway along 40 miles of the Fox River, were merged into a single new company, the Elgin Aurora and Southern Traction Company. The merger was driven by a business syndicate from Cleveland, Ohio. It was the initial success of this Fox Valley Electric Railway that drew in these outside investors intent on creating an electric railway to serve the western Chicago metropolitan area, linking Chicago, Aurora, and Elgin, and many other communities in between. The Cleveland Business Syndicate behind this new enterprise is also a bit complicated, as it involved multiple competing businesses operating successful interurban railways in and around Cleveland, Ohio. They wisely put aside their differences, however, as they saw the Chicagoland business as too great an opportunity to let competition divide them, and so created a new joint venture, merging into the Aurora, Elgin, and Chicago Railway in March of 1901. Not surprisingly, much of the management of this new company was to be from Ohio. And so, in retrospect, we at least partially owe our Illinois Prairie Path and Fox River Trails to a handful of 1900s Cleveland-based railway entrepreneurs. At this time, there were, of course, steam engine railways that were already providing passenger and freight service in the same area, such as the Chicago and Northwestern, the Chicago Great Western, Illinois Central, and others. However, the business opportunity for this new venture was that electric trains could potentially operate much more efficiently using a centralized power source. And from a passenger point of view, electric trains could provide a cleaner experience so that they wouldn't have to deal with the coal, soot, and steam from conventional trains, as well as a potentially faster service as the lighter electric cars could clock speeds of up to 70 miles per hour or more, which was somewhat revolutionary at that time. What was also revolutionary about the A, E, and C was that up till this point, most electric railways used overhead trolley wires to power the electric cars, typically over streets in urban settings. Third rails were used sparingly, again, mostly in urban settings. But the A, E, and C railway was planned to be almost entirely powered by the third rail electrical system, extending for 30 miles east to west and almost 20 miles north to south and well into the countryside. This was considered as something of an experiment by the industry, as the third rail method had not previously been built to such a scale. The advantage of a third rail for electric trains was that it could enable trains to reach very high rates of speed, unencumbered by overhead trolley lines. However, the technical challenges imposed by such a high-speed third rail system included at least two things. First, a highly reliable power source, and second, a very well-constructed, very stable, and very flat track bed. If Illinois is known for anything, it is its state of flatness. Illinois is second only to Florida as being the flattest state in the U.S. of A. So it's no wonder that the Ohio Syndicate saw the Chicagoland topography as absolutely ideal for a high-speed electric railway based on a third rail system. And fortunately, they knew of just the engineers who could build it. At the time when the Cleveland Syndicate was forming in the late 1890s, Charles J. Jones, an immigrant from Wales and a graduate of the Western Reserve in Ohio, was working as the chief engineer for the Lorraine Steel Company, later U.S. Steel, in the Cleveland area, where he had the distinction of being a key engineer on the Lorraine and Cleveland Railway, which for some time held the speed record for electric railways. In 1899, the Cleveland Syndicate lured him away from his Lorraine Steel position to become chief engineer for the newly formed A, E, and C Railway at the age of 36. Ernest Gonzenbach, an ambitious 30-year-old immigrant from Switzerland, 
who had started his railway career in New York, was brought in as the new railway's electrical engineer. These two men were to lay out the design that launched a successful electric railway and which proved adaptable to the evolving business and population shifts of the communities to the west of Chicago and for decades to follow. Jones in particular was singled out for the overall design of the railway, the surveying, its construction, and its long-term adaptability. The initial overall plan of the AE and C Railway was to connect Chicago from 52nd Avenue with major branches to Aurora and Elgin, using the city of Wheaton as a nexus. This new railway totaled almost 60 miles of trackway, with 19 miles from 52nd Avenue to Wheaton, almost 17 miles from Wheaton to Elgin, and almost 15 miles from Wheaton to Aurora, plus seven miles along the Batavia branch and it served an estimated population at that time of 100,000 potential patrons. To power the railway with a reliable electrical source, they would build a power plant in Batavia, Illinois, close by the Fox River, which would supply a continuous source of fresh water for the coal-fired steam engines that would generate 26,000 volts of three-phase 25 hertz alternating current. To distribute this power, three major high-voltage transmission lines left the Batavia power plant. Each of these AC feeders consisted of three balanced wires of four-aught gauge aluminum cables, each wire being a half-inch in diameter. These feeders were carried overland by 40-foot-tall utility poles, spaced 80 feet apart, which also carried telephone lines for communication between dispatchers and train conductors. One high-voltage feeder traveled overland four to five miles southwards to the Aurora substation number one near Hanks Avenue in Aurora. A second feeder traveled overland to Batavia Junction, where it then followed along the railway line to the Warrenville substation number two, a total distance of eight to nine miles. This same line then continued along the railway line to Lombard at Main Street, substation number three, and thence to Maywood at Fifth Avenue, substation number four. The third feeder line traveled overland eight to nine miles northwards to substation number five in what was then Engleton. At Engleton, this feeder line was split, with one branch continuing northwest along the railway line to Clintonville, substation number six. And the second branch headed southeast through Wheaton onto the Lombard number three substation and thence to the Maywood number four substation. In this manner, the second and third feeder lines created two very large electrical loops, providing redundancy of electrical power along the dual trackway from Wheaton to Maywood, the main line. If one of the feeder lines failed, the main line would still have power on at least one of the dual trackways. Each of the substations took in the high voltage feeder lines and used transformers to step down the 26,000 volts of three phase alternating current to about 500 volts AC, which was then fed through machinery called rotary converters, which converted the multi-phase 25 hertz alternating current to about 600 volts of continuous direct current. This 600 volts of direct current was then fed out to the railway line running alongside the substation, where the positive line was applied to the third rail and the negative or circuit return was applied to one or both of the regular train rails. The substations were carefully placed approximately 10 miles apart, each feeding the railway with direct current for about five miles in both directions. And this helps to explain the placement of the substations along the A, E, and C branches. For example, the distance from the Lombard station to both the Warrenville station on the Aurora branch and the Ingleton station on the Elgin branch was almost exactly 10 miles along the trackway. The distance from the Lombard substation to the Maywood substation was 9.3 miles. The distance from Engleton to Clintonville was 8.7 miles. And the distance of Warrenville to the Aurora substation was 7.5 miles. But in both of these latter cases, this slightly reduced interval was likely due to the fact that both of these outlying substations also fed electrical power to railways along the Fox River Valley. The choice of the location of Clintonville for substation number six may also have been affected by other factors. 
It would have been highly desirable for the substation to be close to a road crossing, for ease of building as well as maintenance. Another factor may have been the proximity to existing farmhouses and residences, as well as the willingness of local landowners to grant right-of-way to an electrical substation. It must be remembered that at this time there was a significant faction of dairy farmers who were convinced that newfangled electrical technology would reduce the milk output of their dairy cows. No! As there was only a few road crossings of the railway heading into Elgin at that time, the choices for substation placement were limited. Nonetheless, Canyon Road was at about the right place distance-wise from both Angleton and Elgin. Furthermore, as we'll see later, the local landowners around Clintonville saw that there were far greater and tangible advantages to the proximity of the electric railway than any potential risk of reduced milk production. In the early 1900s, Clintonville was a small town of about 600 people, consisting of a church, two flour mills, a cheese factory, a limestone quarry, and a manufacturer of iron products. In the decade prior, the town had fallen on hard times, due to a rash of fires attributed to an arsonist said to harbor a vendetta, which had destroyed much of the local industry. And so the news of a new electrical substation on its eastern border must have been most welcome, since it promised more freight, more people, more industry, and accessible electrical power to go along with it. By mid-1901, construction of the new railway, including the substations, was well underway. Surveys were completed and rights of way were purchased from local landowners. Contracts were signed with General Electric of New York to supply all of the electrical equipment related to the powerhouse and substations. The Cleveland Construction Company was hired as a general contractor for the project. As the Elgin Line was to open after the Aurora to Chicago Line, the Angleton and Clintonville substations were the last of the six substations to receive their electrical equipment in December 1901, and the last to be fully completed by May of 1902. The substations were built almost entirely of common brick and were approximately 60 feet wide by 40 feet deep. There were two fundamental designs for the substations, a basic model and an enhanced model. The basic model was what we see today in the Clintonville station, where a single room on the main floor was used for electrical machinery with a tower over the back portion of the structure and a small passenger waiting area to one side of the platform in front of the building. The Aurora substation at Hanks Avenue was originally the only station intended to have this basic design. But prior to building, the Clintonville and Engleton stations were also changed to the basic design model. The Warrenville, Maywood, and Lombard substations, on the other hand, were built to the enhanced model specification, which was essentially the basic model design, plus a modest single-story wing adjacent to the machine room which housed a dispatcher's office, a passenger waiting room, and toilets. The enhanced model also included an awning roof over the entire front of the building, while the basic model's awning only perched above the waiting area to one side. The cost of building each substation was about $7,000 to $8,000 for the general construction, plus another $6,300 for the substation electrical equipment. In today's money, That would be about $190,000 for the construction and another $150,000 for the electrical equipment, or about $340,000 in total. The substations were no small investment for the railway and clearly an important part of the infrastructure. As construction completed on the Elgin Line substations to the north, further south along the Aurora Line, Final inspection trips were being made to ensure the soundness and stability of the track bed. The boilers in the newly completed Batavia power plant were finally lit and started to come online, generating 26,000 volts of AC power. Not surprisingly, a few technical glitches came to light as the electrical system came fully into use, which required fixing and which delayed the railway opening by a few months. But the Chicago to Aurora line did then open to much fanfare on the 25th of August, 1902, 
with one-way fares priced at $0.25, cents, or about $6 in 2020 dollars, and $0.45 cents for round-trip fare, which is about $11 in 2020 money. Further north, it would be another several months before the Elgin line opened up, going through the same initial testing as the southern and main branches, before going into full operation on the 26th of May, 1903. In early days of the A, E, and C, the railway was primarily aimed at high-speed transport between the major population centers of Aurora, Elgin, and Chicago, with only a handful of stops along the routes, especially between Wheaton, Aurora, and Elgin. Between Aurora and Wheaton, only the Chicago Golf Grounds, Warrenville, and Eola Junction were listed as full stops, while initially only Wayne was a full stop on the Elgin line. However, flag stops and stations were quickly added along both routes, as well as the main branch, as communities clamored to take advantage of the new railway service. We know that the Clintonville station was minimally a flag stop from 1904 onwards, as was indicated by the early train route maps, as well as newspaper stories. And this makes sense, given that the substation already had a built-in platform and waiting area. So what exactly is a flag stop? A flag stop, which is also known as a request stop, a whistle stop, or, in the UK, a halt, is a station where the train only stops if there are passengers or freight waiting, typically as indicated by a semaphore flag that is set by passengers near the platform. If the flag was set, then the train would stop at the station. Otherwise, it would pass through the station area at speed. Trains designated as express trains would typically bypass flag stop stations, even if passengers were waiting. Given its proximity to multiple large dairy farms in the area, the Clintonville station almost certainly handled a fair amount of milk freight traffic heading towards both Chicago and Elgin, depending on which city was offering higher prices at the time. We know that local South Elgin dairy farmers also benefited in other ways to the proximity of the Clintonville substation. In 1903, Edward Kenyon, whose large dairy farm was just a short distance northwest of the substation, was among the first of the local farmers to utilize electrical power from the AE&C Railway. In the months and years to follow, many other local farmers began utilizing the AE&C electrical power where farmers would purchase 15 horsepower motors and accessories from the railway for $600, or about $13,000 by today's money, for tasks such as threshing, grinding feed, sawing wood, as well as lighting. It was a great labor saver for the farmers, enabling them to expand operations, and it was also a lucrative form of revenue for the young railway. The Clintonville station, as well as all of the other substations, was a manned facility. Each substation employed at least three full-time staff, likely working in shifts such that the daytime shift had two employees, while the nighttime hours likely only had a single staff member working. These employees were known as powerhouse men, and their duties included ongoing monitoring, maintenance, and operation of the substation electrical equipment, as well as recording the station train traffic and passing that info onto the dispatcher station in Wheaton. It was dangerous work and the wages were low. In 1911, Stephen Keeley, a Clintonville substation operator, was struck and killed by one of the AE and C night trains. A year later, operator William Anderson was caught in the high voltage circuitry at Clintonville and was badly burned. In 1913, Wages for these powerhouse workers was only 32 cents an hour, which is about six to seven dollars per hour in today's money, well below the minimum wage in most U.S. states today. Likely from 1903 onwards, the Clintonville substation, in addition to powering the northern half of the Elgin line, was also powering the northern portion of the Fox Valley Aurora Elgin line to the west, as well as the Elgin Street trolley system. In January of 1907, the Clintonville substation electrical equipment was overhauled during a three-day interval so as to prepare it for yet another major electrical load, that being the newly built Elgin Belvedere electric line, which opened in February 1907. In both cases, these additional loads were handled by switching the AC load coming from the Batavia power plant 
through the Clintonville Station, westwards to both the Fox Valley Line and the Elgin Belvedere Line. The switching enabled the substation to manage that external load, as well as isolate those lines in the event of failures or maintenance, either upstream or downstream. The growth of passenger and freight traffic on the Elgin branch, the addition and growth of new railways to the west, as well as being a source of electrical power to farmers and local businesses along the railway, all resulted in the need for expansion of the electrical infrastructure along the Elgin line of the AE and C Railway. In 1908, the AE and C started construction for an additional manned electrical substation between Clintonville and the Elgin Terminal, located at 77 Riverside Drive in Elgin. This substation was to share the electrical burden with Clintonville, particularly for the Fox Valley Railway and the Elgin Street Trolley System. Additional electrical infrastructure improvements continued over the ensuing years, all of which had a bearing on the Clintonville substation. In 1910, the AENC was planning a 24-foot by 36-foot, one-story addition to the Clintonville station. But this never happened, and it's likely that instead this addition went to the Angleton, or Prince Crossing Station, perhaps because it was closer to the railway headquarters in Wheaton. In 1911, the railway upgraded the relays on the high-voltage feeders, as well as the lightning arresters within each of the substations. In that same year, water cooling systems were added to the Aurora and Clintonville substations to supplement the air cooling used to manage the heat pouring out of the station's electrical equipment. Meanwhile, the Maywood and Lombard substations took a different route and instead added ventilators to their rooftop to help control the heat. In 1916, the AENC took advantage of the high price of aluminum, likely due to World War I, to swap out their aluminum high-voltage feeder wires with equivalent resistance copper wiring. The price of aluminum was so high that they managed to replace almost all of their aluminum wiring with a net tidy profit for the company remaining. <coughs> One of the impacts of electric railway on the community was related to public safety. A big topic, and actually too big for this video. Perhaps we'll cover this topic in a future video series. But for now, we can say that the Clintonville Station and Crossing were no different than any other part of the AENC Railway in this regard. Meanwhile, the railway continued to look for ways of optimizing their electrical infrastructure and one new technology that soon caught their attention was automated substations. These substations enabled automated management and operation of the electrical load with little or no human intervention and only occasional maintenance. The AENC Railway took their first tentative step towards this modernization by converting the Warrenville substation from a manned facility to an automated substation in 1919. In the ensuing years, they saw this conversion as a huge success, not only in terms of labor savings, but also in the reliability of the electrical service. And so three years later, in 1922, the railway installed two additional automated substations, one in Bellwood and one in Wheaton, to supplement the existing manned and automated substations. These new substations were fully online within a few years of proven. By the early 1920s, however, the AENC Railway was failing financially, and as a result was bought out and reorganized as the Chicago, Aurora, and Elgin Railway on the 31st of July in 1922. It was about this time that the 25 Hertz AC equipment was removed from both the Clintonville and Aurora substations which may have had to do with the formal separation of the Fox River Division of the AENC as a result of the formation of the Chicago, Aurora, and Elgin Railway, since these two substations provided power to the Fox River trolley system from the earliest days of the AENC. Within a few years, in 1926, the railway was bought out again, this time by industrialist Samuel Insull, who then ruled over a vast U.S. Midwestern financial empire incorporating electrical utilities and railways. It did not take in so long to move electrical power generation and management away from the struggling ca &E Railway, instead consolidating that part of the business under his public service company of Northern Illinois, which later became Commonwealth Edison. 
Within short order, new contracts were drawn up, such that the electrical infrastructure of the railway, including the Batavia powerhouse, all of the substations and the transmission lines, were leased to the public service company, while the ca &E Railway would then purchase their electrical power from the utility going forward. With the Great Depression overshadowing the decade, the 1930s was a relatively quiet time for the Clintonville station, as local economies and the ca and &E Railway struggled along. However, one small improvement was made during this time. In 1930, the Clintonville substation had a parking lot installed on the west side of the building, ostensibly for maintenance workers, but perhaps also to encourage more passenger traffic for the station, while acknowledging the growing influence of automobiles. By the mid-1940s, however, Clintonville, along with the rest of the railway, began a slow but steady decline till the railway's closure in July of 1957. The reasons for this decline are many, including the increased use of automobiles, the construction of the Congress, later Eisenhower Expressway, and the emergence of the publicly funded Chicago Transportation Authority. The ca &E's electrical infrastructure, now managed by the Public Service Company of Northern Illinois, went through a complete modernization program at this time by changing over all equipment to 60 Hz AC, stripping down the Batavia power plant of equipment, converting all remaining manned substations to full automation, and the closure of some of the substations, so as to reduce costs. It is likely that Clintonville was one of those substations that lost its electrical equipment during this modernization, with the main switching room being emptied of machinery. At the same time, the Clintonville siding to the east of the main track line in front of the station was officially retired and no longer maintained. And so for the remaining 10 years of its life, the stripped down Clintonville station fell back to being only a flag stop on the Elgin branch before it was finally abandoned as a station in the late 1950s. But in an ironic twist, new life was brought to the structure in 1953, when it was occupied by the Valley Model Railroad Club, an organization which had started in Elgin in 1947, and which had the mission of recreating railway lines in miniature. Based on a handshake deal of $10 per month, or about $65 per month in today's money, they leased all but the waiting station area in the southeast corner of the building for their club activities, building large model train layouts for club member usage. Once the ca and &E Railway stopped operations in the late 1950s, the club took over the entire building, including the former waiting area, converting it into a kitchenette. In the early to mid-1960s, the concept of a regional nature trail incorporating the former ca and &E Railway right-of-way sprung into existence due to the work of some early visionaries such as May Fieldguard Watts. The Illinois Prairie Path came to life in 1966 due to the tireless work of hundreds of volunteers, primarily in DuPage County to the east. But in 1971 and 1972, the state of Illinois acquired the ca and &E properties along the railway in Kane County and then leased those properties to the Kane County Forest Preserve District for a 20-year period, which enabled the fledgling Illinois Prairie Path to extend past the Clintonville Station and northwards to Elgin. The Kane County Forest Preserve then renewed the rental agreement for the Clintonville facility with the Valley Model Railroad Association, which has subsequently enjoyed unbroken continuity and occupation of this historic building since 1953 with the VMRA responsible for the building's ongoing maintenance and upkeep. To that end, the Valley Model Railroad Association has made many improvements to the Clintonville facility over the past four or five decades, primarily to improve the building's maintenance and livability, but also to preserve the integrity of the building. For example, they removed the parapet along the front of the building, adding new gutters in order to improve drainage from the main roof. They have also replaced the tar and gravel roof with modern rubber seal roofing, repaired the aging brickwork, updated the electrical system, modernized the building's heating plant, and refurbished the parking lot, among many other enhancements. In the end, their zeal to recreate miniature versions of railways 
has resulted in a large-scale preservation of a key historic structure associated with one of the more important regional railways. In the next episode of this series, we'll focus on the Clintonville Station building itself. We'll put together what we've learned about the physical structure of the Clintonville substation building through photographs and measurements, and marry that with what we've learned from the historical record, so as to tease out its secrets and to understand how it worked.